Hi, I'm Ryan Krupp from the Krupp Law Firm, and I'm here today to talk about opioids, the opioid crisis, and addiction, and the cases that come from opioid addiction, including heroin cases, fentanyl, and then prescription drug cases. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the opioid crisis itself, because there's a wealth of information on the internet from free sources, particularly health sources, that you'll probably find uh, more helpful. But we'll kind of move into the legal aspects of it, uh, kind of how the natural transition of addiction happens, and what kind of cases stem from it, and then what are the options. People always ask, like, what is an opioid? An opioid, basically, uh, from somebody that's a lawyer and not a doctor, is a, uh, a medication, typically, that deals with the opioid reactors in your brain, and then it's used to diminish pain. It's used as a pain reliever. So a lot of people see this in simple, every everyday drugs that they get as, as painkillers, like oxycodone, hydrocodone, uh, Vicodin, codeine, and morphine, uh, just to name a few of them of the most common types. But then you have what's called a synthetic opioid, which is uh, common now in the drug community, such as heroin and fentanyl. Now, heroin and fentanyl are not actually opioids itself because uh, they don't have the same composure. However, they still go to the same receptors in the brain, so you're still getting the same feeling. And that's the idea behind the addiction and the transition there. And we'll get more into that. If you paid attention to the news, you've seen a lot of information about uh, addressing the opioid crisis, which is to say that there are so many people addicted to opioids now that uh, people are starting to pay more attention and, and put more resources into the issue. So what do opioids actually do? Opioids trigger the release of endorphins in your brain to make you feel good. They're your feel-good neurotransmitters. Uh, they release endorphins, which muffle your perception of the brain and boost feelings of pleasure, creating temporary but powerful sense of well-being. Being curious about the issue, I reached out to my friend who's a Harvard-educated scientist to see why people are getting addicted in such high numbers, why it's such an issue now. And now, her explanation kind of raised a few issues, including heroin addiction and the overdoses that are on the rise because of the scientific community's underestimation of the addictiveness of opioids, even from decades ago. Now, when these were all coming from legitimate uh, prescriptions, uh, not all of them, but many of them were coming from legitimate prescriptions, such as post-surgery or uh, through car accidents or even people who use them responsibly, uh, they'd get hooked on them quickly. There wasn't much emphasis on recognizing the signs or having physician-supervised tapering especially since the idea out there was that people that would get addicted to drugs or people that were seeking drugs were doing it for bad purposes or ill-minded purposes. But the fact is that couldn't be further from the truth. There's just such a strong reaction to these substances and, and people weren't prepared for the type of reactions that were going to come from it. Uh, the biology of pain and addiction are still developing areas and uh, in the scientific and the medical world, but you know, when I talked to my friend, we were talking about her concerns with the substance being used, and then it stemmed from the idea that once you start to use these substances, there's a detectable uh, physical change of the composition in your brain that really causes the addiction, not just some psychological dependence. Now, at the district attorney's office, when I was working with this, and this kind of moves into the legal aspects of things, uh, one of the things you learn about the substance is the natural transition uh, from what people call is chasing the high. Uh, chasing the high starts with prescription opioids oftentimes, and it's giving you the feeling of euphoria. So for instance, you break your arm, you go to the doctor, and you get a uh, prescription medication for Vicodin. Now you take the Vicodin and you need you begin to build a dependency on the Vicodin because of the feeling it gives you because of the feeling of painlessness that it gives you so even way past the period that you've recovered from breaking your arm you still have a chemical a chemical dependence to the opioid because of the reactors in your brain now after time these prescriptions become either unavailable or they become too expensive and that's what we're seeing is that people weren't having as much access to the prescription medication as they used to. And so people were finding other ways to get the prescription medication. Sometimes you see that people are spending time uh, uh, 
getting prescription medication from friends, family members, stealing prescription medication, even from those who needed it. Uh, but then eventually if it became too expensive or they didn't want to turn to those methods, people were using heroin as a different alternative, uh, mostly because it was cheap and trying to chase the high that they once had before. The idea being that at one point when you first took your first dose of opioid, you felt a certain level of euphoria, and you were never ever able to get back to that same level of euphoria. You felt less high and less high and less high, so you had to take more and more and more. Uh, and it worked the same way with heroin, is that you were using this heroin to replace the idea in your brain of euphoria, and it was a cheaper substance. It could be found on the street, and uh, you still could not get that same first opioid high, so you'd try more and more and more. Now, typically, uh, these heroin substances, which would oftentimes be found in either powder or a capsule form with powder inside, were being sold on the streets, and people were taking them and cutting them with over-the-counter sleeping medication. So one common type of over-the-counter sleeping medication that it would be cut with is called Dorman, and I even reached out and found a package of Dorman. Now this is an, not a prescription medication, this is an over-the-counter drug that has been used to cut with heroin, and the idea being that it would spread out the high because it would make the sleepy euphoria while at the same time saving money by spending less money on drugs so that it could be cut in. And so this Dorman would come in little pink capsules like this, and if you can see it, it's heat sealed, so it's very very hard or maybe even impossible to get back together once it's been broken. And I'll even break it down for you here. So you can see that the Dorman powder is very uh, much like a floury substance, uh, not, not like a salty substance, not much grain to it. And so this sort of stuff would be cut with heroin, and the idea is that it could be uh, ingested through the nasal cavities, uh, ingested orally, and then eventually broken down and then injected into your body using a syringe, uh, which would give you a more direct access to the opioid feeling. And that's the idea we're back at again, chasing the high. You start with a cut substance where you're going 50-50 with your heroin and uh, over-the-counter sleeping pills such as Dorman, and then you're moving into uh, different avenues to get you more high. Now you're at the nose, now you're injecting it. Now you're injecting more heroin and less over-the-counter sleeping pill. And then eventually what you'd find is a lot of people were turning to an even more powerful drug known as fentanyl, which is that synthetic opioid, which was so powerful and it's, it's such a potent substance that it can even affect you and, and uh, make you sick or kill you through seeping through the pores of your skin uh, in some doses, and it being in the heroin itself was causing huge overdoses. Now, one of the biggest reasons for drug overdoses in the heroin uh, area would be that people would be charged with crimes, and they'd be sent to jail uh, or prison, or they would attend rehab programs. And if they didn't complete the rehab program, what happens to your tolerance is if you're away from the drug, your tolerance goes way down. If you're an alcoholic or you have some other method of, uh, of addiction, perhaps you have intolerance, and then your tolerance uh, goes away over time. But with these opioids, without the opioid, your tolerance will, in short periods of time, decrease. Uh, and what we'll, you'll see is that when people would return from rehab, they would go straight to injecting the heroin again, just like they did when they got into the rehab, and it was causing massive overdoses because the tolerance in their body was so low, yet uh, the effect was so high, and so it would, it would cause people to overdose and cause a lot of deaths. So this, this all stems from the legal implications, oftentimes. Oftentimes you get caught with heroin, uh, you're, you're going to, to have an issue of, uh, well, you're going to have a legal, a legal battle against you, and you're also going to have an issue of, am I going to seek treatment? And so the heroin cases, I'd say, primarily come in three, three real uh, criminal-type cases. You have your possession cases, you have your paraphernalia cases, and you have your delivery or distribution cases. 
in your possession cases, almost across the board, every possession of heroin case is going to result in a felony. Typically, that's going to result in a D felony. And so what happens is it doesn't matter if you have, uh, and we'll talk about delivery and distribution, but if you have you know this much heroin or this much heroin or just enough heroin that was inside of a syringe uh, or inside of a spoon or something like that, that would constitute as the possession of heroin and it would constitute as a felony if it was on you. Uh, paraphernalia charge, on the other hand, could be a uh, could be a misdemeanor, but it also could be a felony depending on your past, depending on the drugs, etc. Uh, but the paraphernalia is almost always associated with the thing that was being used to ingest the drugs or to conceal the drugs or anything that had to do with holding uh, or being around the drugs. It's like you have drug and you have drug item. That's drug possession, drug paraphernalia. And so it most commonly be seen in, for instance, heroin possession, heroin syringe. You now have uh, two charges. It could be a felony and a misdemeanor. It could be two felonies. And then you have your delivery and distribution charges, which you can read up on our website about at kruplawfirm.com uh, and look in the criminal cases tab and into heroin, and you'll see what, uh, what the actual degree of distribution and delivery it takes to be charged with it. But that is intended almost exclusively uh, to be used for drug dealers. And what you'll see is that Places are charging people with drug dealer crimes because of the amount of heroin they have on them, not just because of uh, they find them selling the drugs. So they can even imply that you're a drug dealer because of how much heroin you have. And it's really not that much uh, in the grand scheme of things as compared to other drugs. Because it's such a serious issue, prosecutors, state's attorneys, they're taking it very seriously and they want to prosecute uh, uh, deliveries as as much as they can uh, to prevent large quantities of heroin being sold in the state. Now, Missouri uh, enacted what is called the Good Samaritan Law. That's one of the most interesting topics in this issue, is that so many people are overdosing on heroin that, uh, and fentanyl that the state was passing laws that if you were in the vicinity of somebody and you called emergency responders, then you were immune from being prosecuted for the heroin. So even if you were the person doing heroin with the person and you had heroin and fentanyl on you and your friend did it and, and was having an overdose, uh, you could call the police and call the, the, an ambulance or 911 and you could not be prosecuted when they came and they showed up and they found heroin everywhere. And the reason is it's there to save lives so that people don't feel like, wow, uh, I don't want to get caught with heroin. I, maybe I can save this person myself. Well, really... They want people to turn to emergency authorities rather than uh, just solving the issue themselves. So there's some law in place to protect people like that. But also St. Louis and St. Charles counties are putting a lot of emphasis on their drug courts and recovery programs. Uh, they're aimed at helping individuals with addiction uh, rather than prosecuting them. So it kind of works in a way that you'd be prosecuted with a crime. However, instead of defending the crime, Instead of uh, having a criminal defense attorney like myself defend the crime and, and, and say that you're not guilty of the crime or uh, get you a lesser sentence by pleading, you would essentially plead guilty to the charge but do a drug rehab program, which could in turn help save your life, uh, and then they would get rid of those charges, and they call that an SIS. And the idea being that they want to clean the streets of of this substance, and they want to help people at the same time. An issue that you find more and more with heroin as opposed to other cases is that these drug treatment programs have, have proven to be particularly difficult for those addicted to heroin because of the strength of the addiction. So it's not always the case that the drug programs are the best option for the people because you might be better off defending the charge and then uh, in the long run getting a drug treatment program somewhere else. If you have any other questions on heroin, please reach out to me, uh, particularly on how it affects your legal case. You can contact us at 835-9999, or you can look on our website. We have a contact tab. We're not invasive about it. Reach us. Reach out to us. If you have a loved one that's suffering uh, with an addiction and a, and a serious charge, 
uh, please reach out.